My name is David Kennedy Bird, and I am the rector at Foundations Collegium. Uh, this uh, presentation uh, is called A Different Kind of Christian Education. Uh, and I call, I call it that because Foundations Collegium is a program of study that is notoriously difficult to explain to people. This has been our experience over the past few years. You just, you know, when, when you've got uh, when, when you've got some sort of um, you know enterprising thing going on, you're, you're supposed to be able to give a you know, 30 second elevator speech to explain what you do, and so everybody's you know got their elevator speech worked out. <coughs> I, I work at Dunder Mifflin. I'm the regional manager. That sort of thing. I, I've, I've, I've struggled in vain for years to come up with a 30-second elevator speech to explain this program. But it's very difficult because it's, it's, it's just a strangely shaped animal. It isn't the kind of education that people are accustomed to. It's got tentacles that poke out all over the place. It's, it's just it's a different sort of thing. Uh, I will try to give you a sense of the ways in which it is unique. The, the ways in which we're doing something that a lot of the other educational programs are not doing. A few broad distinctives. Foundations Collegium is a thoroughly, radically Christian and biblical program. We need to get that out of the way right up front. Um, this program is all about God. The one true God. The God who has spoken through the scriptures of the Old Testament and the New Testament. The God who has spoken in the person of Jesus Christ, who died and, and rose again in order to bring life to humanity. That's at the very center of what we do at Foundations Collegium. You know, we read the Bible, we seek to understand the Bible, we seek to understand what God has to say to us in the scripture. The reason why I'm you know, hammering on that is because we talk about a lot of other stuff too. But we talk about Buddhism, we talk about secular humanism, we explore world cultures, we look at you know, so many different frameworks uh, for uh, philosophy and, and, and religion and, and different explanatory systems. And it, It's important that you understand that what this program is all about is the Lordship of Jesus Christ and training these students to go out there and connect with the culture in such a way that they can represent the kingdom of our Lord and God, um, but in an informed way, you know, with an understanding of what Buddhism is all about, and, and New Age thought, and postmodernism, and secular humanism. Which leads us to my second point here. We are training disciples of Jesus Christ, whose minds are fully equipped with tools for use in His service. We're training warriors for participation in spiritual warfare. Now, in the current you know, political climate, you always have to give a disclaimer when you say something about, we're training warriors. Um, what I mean by that is people uh, whose minds are filled with truth and who are able to engage in conversation with anybody, no matter what their understanding of reality. They are able to engage anyone in a discussion of what it's all about, what society is all about, what government is all about, what the meaning of life is, is there a difference between good and evil? How should I direct my energies? How should I direct my life? Those kinds of big questions. Um, so the kind of warfare we're talking about is not a, a warfare that involves you know, actual conflict. It involves ideas and commitments. Uh, it involves uh, you know, the direction in which communities and culture are moving. And I would like to send out into the world a community of students who are equipped to carry on that kind of warfare, warfare against evil, um, using using words and ideas uh, and, and ministry um, as their weapons. Foundations Collegium is a worldview training program. Now, in saying that, I have to be careful because uh, many people, when they um, when they think of a worldview training program, they think of a class or a camp, like a two-week camp like Summit Ministries, which is an excellent program, or a weekend conference or something like that. Foundations Collegium isn't any of those things. Foundations Collegium is actually a whole program of study that involves lots of different subject areas. So when I say that we are a worldview training program, I don't mean that we just study something called worldview. I mean 
everything that we study has worldview implications, and I'm trying to train these students uh, to engage worldview at every level of, of human cultural activity, whether, whether they are doing um, literature or the arts or studying history or government or philosophy or um, you know, whatever the area may be. It's all about worldview. You know, sooner or later, you figure out that worldview isn't like this thing over here among other topics. Worldview is all of it. What, what you understand to be the case about literature and government and life and family, all of that is worldview. And Foundations Collegium is a worldview training program, but we do you know, address you know, the scriptures and critical thought and literature and history and all these things. Foundations Collegium is a leadership training program. This does not mean that we are teaching students how to administer an organization. That's not what I mean by leadership. That's one kind of leadership. It means that we are equipping them with the tools they will need to influence other people in understanding reality accurately. So the kind of leadership that I'm wanting to foster in these kids is the ability to um, influence the thinking of the people that they spend time with over a coffee table, you know, over a table at Panera Bread, you know, in conversation with, with two or three friends. They can display leadership by influencing the way those people understand what's going on around them. Uh, and that is an important part you know, of, of what leadership is. And maybe some of these people will go on to you know, some kind of institutional leadership or positions in government. That would be terrific. But that's not what I'm trying to train them for. I'm training them to make an impact on their culture one relationship at a time, one person at a time. Our curriculum is highly unusual in both its organization and its content. Um, the way we have organized the subject matter uh, is quite different from the traditional structure of a school curriculum. And we have very good ideas for, for doing this. Our subject matter uh, emphasizes unity, bringing together the various topics, the various subjects that we are engaging in the program and weaving them all together so that the student can see the connections between literature and history and you know, religion and philosophy and, uh, and, and political life and all these different kinds of things. The, the students can see that the world is not busted up into a bunch of distinct things, like English is over here, and mathematics is over here, and history is over here. Well, that's not how reality is laid out. And so we are trying to help the student to understand reality as one big picture, and to, to gain an understanding of various parts of that picture and how they all fit together. And finally, Foundations Collegium is not easy. It's hard. It involves a lot of reading, a lot of writing, a lot of academic focus, and a lot of thinking. Now, actually, Foundations Collegium uh, involves more than one program. There's the Foundations and Frameworks program, the preparatory course, the standard course. Um, some of these involve more writing than others. The, the Foundations and Frameworks program actually involves very little writing, but it involves a lot of speech preparation and preparation for debate. Um, so the program is not necessarily for students who struggle in their studies. It's for students who are willing to invest some time in doing a lot of reading and a lot of preparation for class. And their time will be amply rewarded. It is so much fun. It is intensely fun. We have a lot of laughs. Uh, it's, there's a lot of you know, creative engagement that goes on. I mean, we have, we have the time of our lives. But it, it's not a free ride. It's, it's, it's difficult stuff. We need to know that up front. Okay, let me just sort of step aside for a second and talk about two competing visions uh, among God's people. Two competing visions for what life is all about, what the Christian life is all about. Um, and I'm wanting to do this because one of these visions is what we are trying to foster at Foundations Collegium, and the other one is not. Vision number one is what I call the purposeless Christian life. <clears throat> and here's how that looks. The Christian life consists in salvation, you, know, you get saved, and then you try to get other people saved. You bide your time waiting for the rapture, trying to live righteously during the interim, you know, during the next few decades before you die, 
you, you want to get it right and you know, try to live clean if you can. Please God. Um, there's not much of a larger understanding of our purpose in this world. Like, what, what impact does God want us to be making on the world we've been placed in? Is, is it really all about accepting Christ into your heart to be your personal Savior, and then, you know, 40 years later you die and go to heaven, and, and that's it? Or does God have a job description for us while we're here, while we're in the midst of all this cultural turmoil? Is there something God wants us to be doing, something very important, something defining that God wants us to be doing? Well, this purposeless Christian life doesn't really put a lot of emphasis on bringing about you know, large-scale changes in human culture. Um, this vision of the Christian life gives students no sense of why they are here and what their education is supposed to be preparing them for. Christian education on this model places very little emphasis on training students to assume cultural, intellectual, and spiritual leadership. And students who have been taught in this way are the ones who drift off and lose their faith when they go to college. And that is something that has been, according to some statistics I've been looking at, this has been happening at an alarming rate in recent years. Students who are raised in church, go off to college, lose their faith, decide that they aren't Christians anymore, which is a tragedy. And I think the students for whom that is happening are primarily the students who have been given this purposeless vision of what the Christian life is all about. Well, that's, that's depressing. Let's talk about a different vision for the Christian life. I'm calling this the Kingdom of God. Does that sound familiar? I borrowed it from the Bible. Um, you, you read the Gospels, you read the New Testament, and you just cannot miss these references to the Kingdom of God or the Kingdom of Heaven. What God is doing in this world, He's on the move, He's up to something, and He's drawing people to Himself to participate with Him in bringing about large-scale change. That's an exciting vision, and that is actually the message of the New Testament. Not this, you become a Christian, and then you sit around for 60 years, and then you die and you get to go to heaven. That's, that's not really what you get when you read the New Testament. That's not the message. The message, the message is similar to what um, has been expressed by Dallas Willard in his book, The Divine Conspiracy. That's a great title, The Divine Conspiracy. And what he means by that, uh, the divine conspiracy, is that God is sort of mysteriously moving. Um, he's bringing about, you know, a, he's bringing about some things. He's, he's got an agenda. He's, he's, he's changing things. He's shifting things around. And he wants to invite you to, to come along and, and be a part of what he's doing. And of course, the way you do that is by um, you know, entering into a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. But once you've done that, you know, you're on the team. And, you, and you're part of the divine conspiracy, part of this community of people that God is, um, is gathering together to, to bring about healing and wholeness and reconciliation among communities and nations, um, and to bring about healing within you know, individual human persons. The Christian life consists in entering into relationship with God through Christ and being engaged in His service. And the larger picture that we find ourselves in is that we are involved in a war. And again, by war, I don't mean that we're you know, storing automatic weapons and trying to overthrow the government. I mean, the war that we're involved in is a war between you know, spiritual kingdoms, of you know, the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God. If you, you know, think all of that stuff is silly, you don't believe in the kingdom of Satan or the kingdom of God, then you know, your, your kids might not be a good fit for this program. because. We talk about this stuff all the time, that, that we are caught in the turbulence that is kicked up in the, the confrontation between God's kingdom and the enemy's kingdom. That's where we find ourselves. The kingdom of God is on the move, and we are a part of it, as are our children. Christian education on this model places a great deal of emphasis on training children to assume cultural, intellectual, and spiritual leadership. It will also, you know, Christian education that is built on this idea, will emphasize the nature and dynamics of God's kingdom and of the war we are involved in against the kingdom of darkness. That's how we roll, a 
the Foundation's collegiate. Let me tell you a quick parable. I've actually got a like half hour long version of this parable when, when I've got the leisure to, to really get into it. But uh, I won't give you the half hour long version, I'll give you the two minute version of it. It goes something like this. There are two pilgrims who arrive at a gatehouse. A pilgrim is some, simply someone who is on a journey uh, for religious purposes, some kind of a spiritual search. The first pilgrim arrives at the gatehouse, knocks on the door, is granted admission, um, you know, is, is given a bath, is given new clothing, tools and armaments. The, the gatehouse is the experience of salvation, of being cleansed by what Jesus Christ has done for us. And that first pilgrim stays in the gatehouse along with a lot of other pilgrims who are doing the same thing. There's a big roaring fire in a fireplace over there, and there's some tables where there's snacks laid out. People are just having a good old time in the gatehouse. And they are missing out on the fact that there's a door on the other side of the gatehouse, and you're supposed to exit through that door and actually get out into the world where there's stuff to be done, where there's a mission to be carried out. Pilgrim number two comes along. He knocks on the door of the gatehouse, they, they bring him in, give him a bath, dress him in some fresh clothing, give him some tools, you know, some weapons, some armor, and he says, okay, what's next? Am I supposed to leave now and accomplish something? And the, and the gatekeeper says, ha, somebody who gets it. And he does. Pilgrim number two exits the gatehouse and discovers that there's a whole kingdom out there and there's a, and there's a war going on and there's, and there's a use for his weaponry and his armor and the tools that he's been equipped with. And he spends the rest of his life creatively and significantly engaged in large things. And then eventually when he dies, you know, he, he gets drawn up into the, you know, the, the mountains in the west or you know, some wonderful image like that you know, to, to join the kingdom, uh, to join the king forever. But in the meantime, he has been investing his life in real stuff, not just hanging out in the gatehouse. We aren't meant to live in the gatehouse for the rest of our lives. We get into the gatehouse, we get equipped with what we need to live the Christian life, and then we get on out into the battlefield. And that's what, at Foundations Collegium, we're trying to train these young people for. Engagement in the real battlefield, the, the real um, context of this world where there's cultural stuff going on, there's political stuff going on, there's people with broken lives, there's institutions that, that are corrupted, that need fixing, there's just there's messages flying all over the place, many of which are false messages. It's a confusing place and there's lots of room for people who have their heads on straight and their hearts have been transformed and they've got lots of good equipment to get in there and really make a difference and that's what we're trying to train our students for. Okay, let me step outside of that little discussion into another one. I call this a tale of two, a tale of two schools. Um, and the, the purpose of this little parable is to uh, challenge you to think a little bit differently about the way education is structured. I want to tell you about two schools, the, the bad school and the good school. But I'm, I'm being tricky, I'll just warn you. Spoiler alert, I'm being tricky here. Okay, school number one is the bad school. Nobody likes this school. The entire community is upset with it. It is universally recognized to be a horrible learning environment. There's drugs, alcohol, violence, sexual assault, promiscuity. They have to have guards posted. You know, it's just, it's not a safe place for students to be. There's indiscipline in the classrooms. The teachers waste so much time correcting students and dealing with silliness that they could be spending on actually teaching. Um, there's low academic standards. I mean, they, they just can't expect too much. The whole place is framed in such a way that there are low expectations on these students. There's a very low percentage of the students who end up going to college. And the content of the textbooks and the teaching, oh my word, so much falsehood, so much corrupt content. There's, there's very little to praise about this school. Okay, let's leave that school behind. We don't even want to talk about that school anymore. School number two, the good school, <sighs> at long last. Here we have a morally secure environment where students can go, they don't have to worry about being assaulted or you know, sexual activity or, or being exposed to drugs or alcohol. It's, 
and that sort of thing just isn't going on. The classrooms are disciplined, they are efficient teaching situations where there's actually instruction going on, a lot of it. The teachers don't have to waste their time on you know, getting kids to stop standing on the desks and you know, stop punching Billy in the face and that kind of thing. And, you know, there's, there's, there's teaching going on, which is a good thing because it's a school. The academic standards are high. They have high expectations for the students, and those expectations are you know, regularly met. Um, there's an impressive track record of high SAT scores and college placement. Uh, these kids do well on tests, and they get into good schools. Um, the textbooks and the teaching tend to feature better content than the, the stuff in the other school. I mean, just when social issues and, and the sciences and, and just whatever uh, is being represented, religious uh, issues, the content in the textbooks um, it basically presents an accurate view of, of reality, a view that, that Christians would not have to um, disapprove of. Um, and maybe there's even, if it's a Christian school, uh, maybe there's even Bible teaching and prayer uh, available as you know, part of the, the larger picture of what these students are being exposed to. Okay, I warned you in advance that I was going to be tricky, and here's the tricky part. I would now like to tell you that these two schools are actually putting out the same product. And that's not to downplay the fact that there's a lot of good stuff happening in this school that is not happening in this school. You know, obviously, there are important differences. But what the students are getting in both schools is a chaotic mass of disconnected information. They're learning all this stuff in their English class, and then they study French over here, and then history, you know, the ancient world, the Middle Ages, and, and then they're studying you know, biology over here, and, and all this stuff, it's all this stuff being thrown at them from different directions and from different teachers, and none of it is connected together in any way. The student might graduate with honors. The student might do very well in his studies. We're talking about a good student who does well. Nevertheless, he's probably going to forget the vast majority of what he studied in school. Why? Because how can you remember a lot of chaotic stuff that isn't connected together? I mean, think, think back on your own experience in school. Um, the, the kind of education that we all got was basically the sort that I just described. And you've probably forgotten most of what you learned in school. And you know, you're reasonably intelligent people. It's, it's, not, it's, not the, it's not the student's fault. It's the fault of the, the randomness. You know, if, if someone shares with you a five minute long story, I mean, they, they, they tell you a story, it's about five minutes in length, you listen carefully, chances are you could repeat that story, maybe not word for word, but you'd, you'd get it right. You could repeat the story to someone else. But what if somebody spends five minutes just making random comments to you? A statement, a sentence, a question, a little joke, a funny observation, something ridiculous, another statement, another sentence, a comment about toasters and traffic lights. And then five minutes later, they stop. You're not going to remember all that stuff, and you're not going to be able to repeat it back afterwards because it was all disconnected. There was nothing unifying all of it into one one package, one thing that can be easily remembered. Well, that's how education is normally approached. And that's how we try not to approach it at Foundations Collegiate. We try to give the student an experience in which everything is connected. What the student is learning about literature and the arts is connected to history. And it's all connected to ideas and, and religion and spirituality and, 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 uh, and social communities. And, and political communities. It's all connected. So the student is able to say, oh yeah, I sort of get how everything fits together. The student graduates from the program, goes out into the real world, and is not confused by what he encounters you know, in, in the larger society. He's able to you know, examine governmental institutions, social institutions, you know, cultural trends, the entertainment industry, whatever, and he's, he's able to make sense of all of it. He's able to, to think it all through uh, in, in a coherent way because the education that he received equipped him to do that. Okay.
here is yet another this this presentation is nothing but introductions have you have you noticed that i i like a presentation that's made up of nothing but introductory material that way you feel fresh the whole time it's like oh wow he's still on the introduction this is great i feel like i just got it. um introduction number four it is no longer the year 1012 I'm just, I'm enraptured by that line. I'm sorry, I think that's very clever. <laughs> that was then, this is now. Actually, I should say, um, this, this little line was written last year when it was 2012, now it's 2013. It is no longer the year 1013. But let's pretend it is. <coughs> the year is 1013. Um, it's the central Middle Ages. You know, all, all the stuff that you've learned about the Middle Ages, knights in armor and monasteries and all that stuff, that's, that's what's going on around us. What, what do you need to know in order to be competent on the job a thousand years ago? Unless you are a skilled craftsman, you probably only need to master the use of a few basic farming implements along with an appetite for good hard work. And you're good to go. You're going you're gonna to do just fine because most people were, were involved in agriculture. They, they worked the fields, they raised animals, and you, you needed you know, a basic skill set to do, do those things, and you needed to be willing to work, and then you would do just fine. A thousand years later, in the year 2013, what do you need? Years of training in all manner of systems and content areas in order to be considered competent in a profession. The world has gotten a lot more complicated. Is our participation in the culture as Christians any different? In the year 1013, you only needed a few basics and you were good to go. Society was much simpler then. You know, in order to understand how you know, biblical faith connected with the, the fairly simple culture around you, you didn't, you didn't need a vast body of information. Um, now, a thousand years later, we are immersed in a dizzyingly complex web of cultural patterns that can only be navigated with a great deal of wisdom and knowledge. Enter Foundations Collegiate. So in, in all these little um, introductory riffs, I'm, I'm basically just trying to come at you from different directions to show you uh, various reasons why something like foundations, this strangely shaped animal that is so difficult to explain to people, why it's necessary, why this bizarre creature that I am unable to come up with an elevator speech about is something that is very badly needed in the church today. Um, and now let me just give you sort of a survey of uh, information about Foundations Collegium, how it works. Uh, everything I've told you so far has been kind of broad. Foundations Collegium is based on what I like to call four pillars. The first one is Christianity, you know, the, the gospel, the kingdom of God, basic biblical truth. A commitment to biblical faith as absolute truth, defining and non-negotiable. We start there. Another one would be academic integrity, a commitment to intellectual honesty, freedom of inquiry, and discussion, and a commitment to being authentic as persons evincing the reality of Christ in our lives through our speech and actions. Another of the four pillars would be unity and worldview. We've spent a lot of time talking about that already. A commitment to the unity of God's world. The fact that in His universe, all knowledge fits together and makes sense as a whole. And to bringing our entire edifice of thought and perception into alignment with God's. Finally, spiritual warfare. A commitment to serving in God's kingdom, opposing the kingdom of darkness, intellectually, morally, culturally, and spiritually. So those are four pillars or foundation stones. I realize a pillar is not the same thing as a foundation stone, but four you know, structural supports that give our program its unique shape. Foundations Collegium fosters worldview development. Now we talked about that earlier that it is a worldview, uh, a worldview development program, but by that I mean we, we deal with all kinds of stuff, history and literature and critical thought and 
um, and Christian theology and, and the scriptures and communication skills, all sorts of things, but it's all bundled in such a way as to enable the student to construct a unified worldview that is built around God and His kingdom. The bottom line is that Foundations Collegium is a leadership training program, and I alluded to that earlier. Our students will go out and make a difference in the church and in the general culture. Um, hopefully, uh, they will make a significant difference. But if, if, they, if each of our students makes a difference in the lives of a few people through the one-on-one -on -one, uh, engagements, one-on-one -on -one interactions, that would be, I would feel like, a raging success, having equipped students to get out there and, and uh, influence the lives of other people in that way. Okay, the character and structure of the program. The overall curricular framework has uh, got three different programs. Uh, one, one of which is called the standard course, and it's longer, it's four years in length. There's the preparatory course, which is two years in length. And then there's something that we're calling the Foundations and Frameworks program. It's just one year. And each of them is somewhat different. Um, but the general idea is that we take you know, the humanities, history, and philosophy, and you know, literature, and the arts, uh, and we take you know, habits of critical thought, and worldview analysis, and Christian theology, and uh, an in-depth study of the scriptures, and um, you know, writing skills, and speaking skills, all this stuff. And we, and we bundle it all together into one package. In other words, we don't have you know, one class over here, and a different class over here, and a different class over here, but it's all kind of woven together to give the student a unified learning experience. Now, we try to set it up so that in you know, reporting credits on your transcript, it can be separated out in the kind of way that people expect, you know, English credits, history credits, etc. But the, the way we do things in the program tends to be much more unified than that. Uh, required work and assessment uh, involves uh, occasional quizzes and exercises in class. Um, depending on which which of the three programs the student is involved in, uh, there may be a number of compositions per semester. Um, in, in all three of the programs, there will be a number of speeches per semester. Students present oral presentations to give to the class, uh, and some of these are oral presentations to which the other students will respond in a, a sort of a question and answer debate symposium kind of a format. Uh, and those are a lot of fun. Um, the final exam each semester is an oral examination. What that means is that I set up an individual exam appointment with each individual student, and we sit together in my kitchen. The student sits at my kitchen table, and I sit at the other side of the kitchen. Um, and the student basically has two or three hours to tell me what he's learned that semester. And it's a little more structured than that. But it's not one of these, um, you know, which of the following four statements is true of Charlemagne? A, B, C, or D. No, the student actually has to sit there and talk to me and give me a coherent account of the, of the various subject areas that we studied that semester. The student has to convince me that he, has been paying, you know, he or she has been paying attention all semester. The student you know, comes armed with you know, a stack of notes, or the student doesn't have to come with notes, but it would be a good idea. Um, as long as the student doesn't you know, do this number and, and read read to me off the notes, because I want to know what's inside the student's head. It, it turns out to be a great uh, method of, of examining these kids, and it's a, it's a more real, real world method, because in the real world, there will be numberless opportunities to talk to people about things that you've learned, whereas the opportunities to sit down in a desk and, and write little essays and turn them into somebody will be fairly few. And, um, in these oral exams, I, I think we are, the, the examination itself is a kind of preparation for uh, engaging people uh, in a way that's convincing, um, you know, engaging people with passion and conviction, uh, talking about what you know. I mean, that's what an exam should be, sharing what you know. What have you learned this semester? Uh, the oral exams are a lot of fun, and it's one of the really unique um, 
features of the program. A lot of students don't really encounter oral examinations until they've gone through college and they get to graduate school. And then they, you know, they get drilled by their, their professors. Um, but these students get drilled by me. Um, and it's not nearly as terrifying an experience as I'm making it sound. Let's see, what else do we have here? Projects. Uh, depending on which version of the program we're talking about, there may be uh, one or more projects that they're called upon to assemble, um, you know, representing one of the modules into which the, the program is structured. Uh, textbooks. There's quite a number of textbooks uh, that, the, uh, that the students um, are assigned readings from. There's a lot of reading. You know, no matter which version of the program the student is engaged in, there's a lot of reading. Um, and it's not necessarily easy reading. Some of the uh, material may be considered uh, at the uh, student's grade level. Uh, some of it may be way over the student's grade level. Um, these, these students are challenged at every point. Sometimes the reading, in some cases the reading has been so difficult that they've struggled with it. I, I, I recall uh, one year I was using a history of philosophy text by W.T. Jones. It's, it's a classic text. And some of the students hated it because it was basically college level stuff. And some of the students really enjoyed it. Uh, but for all of them, um, it, was, uh, it was not an easy endeavor wading through all of that stuff. So there's a lot of reading. Uh, there are some written assignments. Again, depending on which version of the program you're involved in, there may be more uh, than, than in others. Um, the classroom situation uh, is relaxed. We meet in a living room sitting around on living room furniture. We don't have these wooden desks where you're cramped like this and everybody's facing in the same direction. Um, it's, it's a very enjoyable, uh, congenial atmosphere. I do a lot of lecturing, kind of like I'm doing now, but there's also a lot of class discussion. There are you know, oral presentations given by the students. So it's kind of a, it's a mix of stuff, sometimes audiovisual stuff. I'll show them you know, a documentary or something. And this is fun. Uh, in the background, I've always got music playing, and the, I, I call it the, the daily soundtrack. And the music uh, is associated with whatever period in history we happen to be studying at the time. So if we are, uh, if in a particular semester we happen to be in the Baroque period, like the 1600s and early 1700s, I've got Baroque era music playing in the background the whole time, and that sort of uh, that sort of lends to the vibey sense of being in the 1600s and, and 1700s when you've got Bach and Vivaldi and Purcell and, and people like that providing our music. Okay, um, let me just go ahead and close with a, an announcement about the specific two programs that we are offering this coming year. Um, we're not doing the standard course this coming year. We're doing the preparatory course in the Foundations and Frameworks program. Um, we're in the second year of the preparatory course. It's a two-year thing. We're going to be doing the second year of it. Students can you know, graft themselves into the second year, no problem. That's, that's fine. And in the preparatory course, the, the nine academic tracks are as follows. Geography, world history, world literature, New Testament, the Christian life, worldview studies, critical thinking, language and rhetoric, and something that I call academic toolbox, which has to do with study skills and taking notes and all that kind of thing. The Foundations and Frameworks program, oh, and the preparatory course meets two full days, basically, per week. It's going to be on Wednesdays and Fridays. The Foundations and Frameworks program meets one afternoon per week, and uh, we are still determining whether it's going to be on Tuesdays or Thursdays. And so that's like from 12.30 to 4.30. And the Foundations and Frameworks program is structured into uh, biblical studies, uh, Christian theology, worldview studies, um, critical thinking, and speech and debate. Those are the five areas. So it's a more limited palette than the preparatory course, which is why I'm able to fit it into one afternoon per week during one year. So that's what we're offering this year. It's all going to be fun. It's going to be a wild ride. You should, you should apply. You should have your, have your students apply. Uh, and uh, I think we're at a logical stopping point. Thanks for coming. <laughs>